Feel that fucking shot in my dick. <laughs> Do you remember how we had um Nathan Hazard on the podcast? Uh -huh. He tells a story where he like got beta blockers. What is that? Like he got like he went on on the news and he was super nervous if he took beta blockers. Oh yeah. I would, I need to get some of those. Oh, wait, what does that do? It like basically um, keeps you from producing adrenaline so you don't get nervous. Well, you don't get sleepy, it's not like Xanax. Yeah, but then you just knock a bunch of stuff over or something. Yeah, he like exploded the entire cock, we were the cock to explode it, I remember. Should she get some ice out here? Yes. Um, it's good to have nerves, though. I mean, you're like, you're being your wife. Yeah.
Oh, I'm going to let Natalie in because she can let me know if everything's looking good. Okay. Hey, Natalie, can you throw your video on real quick? Hey, I'm like, I'm glad to see you already because I want to make sure everything is sounding good and looking good. It's good. Sounds good. Looks beautiful. Love your lipstick. Thanks. And then, okay, so then how's that view look on your end? Yeah, that looks great. I can see, yeah. Wow, how do you do that? Oh, hey, I'm excited. <laughs> Me too. I'm nervous. You're going to do great. How many people are signed up? We're sold out. Over 100. Oh, my goodness. I know. And, uh, and we're live streaming. There's people on the live stream already. Oh, they're probably watching me right now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We're not that we're on live stream already. Right, do you got lipstick on it? Yes. No. Okay. I'll see the live stream people get the behind the scenes look. <laughs> Whoopsies. Behind the scenes. Special. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, Adele's almost ready here. I think I'm ready. I did pee, so that's good. Um, okay. <laughs> We got all right one minute i'm gonna start laying people in yeah okay i'm gonna start laying people in <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right. We are. Ah! All right, did something wacky. <clears throat> all right. Hi, everyone. We're just going to let everyone be joining. Brandy, yeah. Um, as for uh, as people are joining, if you guys want to put in the chat, uh, like where you're where where you're tuning in from, I think it's kind of cool because I know we have people from all over the place that are tuning in right now. So I'm really excited about that. And I'll be like moderating. Oh, hello from LA. Woo. Hi, everyone that's joining us. We'll just give a few moments here. If you want your screen, have your screen. If you don't want your screen, fine. <laughs> Let's see. Hi, everyone. Hey, 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 hey. Hi, Seth. How's it going? Eric, what up? Luis, Hello. how's it going? How's it going? We got Natalie over here, right on. Yeah, if you guys want to put in the chat where you're all tuning in from or joining us from, I know we've got people from all over the place coming into this fun webinar. I'm really excited. New Hampshire. Awesome, Charlotte, fantastic. Charlotte, yep, nice, nice. Oh, we got more people joining, let's admit them. Oh my gosh, Australia, it's 9 a.m., what the? You're crazy, man. <laughs> oh, Portland, hey, we're in the smoke too down here in, in LA, I hear you. My mom just, my mom's in Sandy. Salem, Massachusetts, cool, 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 amazing. Wonder, all right, oh, let's see if I have, oh, wait, on, let me go bigger here, chat, there is participants. San Diego's here, San Diego's in the house. <clears throat> We're going to give some time. I know that we got a lot of people joining us. So we'll, I'll give like maybe like 
one more minute for anyone who wants to join in and then I will uh, kind of get going here. Just get yourselves all comfortable and everything, you know, settle down, settle in. All right, Australia, who's from Australia? Raise your hand. Do I see you right now? Non-video participants, show non-video participants. Ah, hello, well, hi. <laughs> All right, all right. 14. Chat. Let's see. Australia, Salem, LA, Boise, Idaho, DC. Winnie, you're from LA. We're in LA. We're all smoked out over here. Tijuana. Nice. Too cool, too cool, too cool. Okay. Well, as people keep joining, I, I hope that I'm letting them in because. I think it should be doing it automatically. Oh, that's a mute. Yep, 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 yep. Cool. Okay. All right, we have like a pretty full screen here. I'm really excited. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Okay, that's number one, we're good. Uh, and let's see, uh, I, I'll just kind of like get going with a little introduction to like what we're doing here. Um, I am Shauna, I'm Shauna Race, and I, uh, I'm the owner and um, creator of talk, the whole Talktails everything, Talktails the podcast, Talktails entertainment, Cocktails with Talktails. Um, so I, I'm pretty, uh, I've been teaching classes now for about over a year with Cocktails with Talktails. And uh, I was doing it in person before lockdown, and then I took that platform that I was teaching in person, and when the lockdown, uh, switch to not be able to be around people i brought it all on this virtual platform which is really fun and really cool and i've been meeting people from all over the world which is amazing and um the, i'm feeling more connected than i feel like i've ever been connected funny enough so um i just want to uh we do have a sold out crowd here today so good job guys like super stoked i'm really happy that everyone's joining us for this awesome thing it is mezcal week so uh this is so fitting that we're doing this class this is our first free webinar that we're doing uh cocktails with cocktails we offer classes daily um and you could just go on the website or uh eventbrite and it's all on there if you want to take more personalized classes not in this big format of like so many people on the webinar uh but I started thinking, I'm like, you know what, during this pandemic and everything, a lot of bigger brands uh, get the love, you know, because people know about them and people can access them at the grocery stores and whatnot. But uh, a lot of these smaller brands are uh, having a little more hard time for exposure because us bartenders are the ones that kind of get the word out about this. So I was like, shoot, you know, why don't we do something really cool here? You know, let's like incorporate a smaller brand and uh and do a free webinar and just like you know see who shows up and we'll just have a good time and make some cocktails and so who would i you know i'd had to include my uh par partner in crime adele who is uh, my co-host for uh my on our podcast talk tales the podcast and she uh represents union mezcal and she's a mezcal whiz she knows it all uh i learned stuff from her daily um, and then I just, before we really start getting into all of the cocktails and the information about Union Mezcal, um, let, I, I just want to let everyone know, everyone's going to be muted. Uh, if you have questions, feel free, uh, throw them in the comment section and I'm going to be moderating the whole thing for the most, Hey, Boyle Heights. Nice. Um, and, uh, and so I will be kind of moderating while Adele's going to leave this class with us. Um, so, oh, and then afterwards I'll unmute and we can do a Q and A and any like questions or if you want to talk to Adele or myself, which we'll leave some time for that at the end. Um, yeah, so like I've been in the bar industry 15 years, like this is why I'm qualified to do this. <laughs> I know it. Uh, and then, uh, so now we got this webinar situation going and thanks everyone for joining. This is the first of many of these webinars and that we're doing with cocktails with cocktails. Um, so uh, make sure to join our mailing list um, and we'll keep you up to date 
as far as everything we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, without further ado, let me please introduce my my good friend. Uh, it's time to learn about Mescal and welcome Adele Martinez. Uh, and give her a round of applause. Hi guys. All right, hang on, we're going to switch over here. And there she is. How's it going? Hello. Hello, Martinez. Hi, hello everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, welcome to Cocktails with Cocktails. My name's Adele Martinez. Um, I have been a bartender for about better part of a decade, so I would consider myself kind of qualified to do this. Um, I also co-host Talk to us a podcast with my best friend, Shauna Reyes, who is hosting this entire awesome event. Um, and I just recently started collaborating with Mezcal Union. I'm very excited about it because I really love this brand. And like Shauna was saying before, little brands need some love. Right now in the quarantine, if you're not like a big spirits nerd or like have a bar background, it's really, um, I guess, this information is not super readily available to you. Uh, so when you go and shop for your alcohol, you go for what you know, the big brands, but the big brands already have enough money. The people who need the money are the little brands, the people who are really trying to create small batch craft products, um, they need your help. So in an effort to push those brands forward, we are now doing this webinar for you guys. I hope you guys enjoy. And uh, let's let's allow ourselves to have a little bit of fun. We're gonna drink some mezcal. We're gonna make some cocktails. We're gonna learn a few things on the way. So it should be it should be pretty fun. So um, let's start with what is mezcal. I will tell you what mezcal is not. Mezcal is not a smoky tequila. So please let's stop calling it not that for now. Uh, mezcal is a very, very beautiful um, agave distillate. It's very nuanced, it's very layered, it's very complex. So when we call it a smoky tequila, it becomes a very reductive term. Um, to illustrate that, let's get straight to the point and let's start drinking some mezcal. So if you will grab your bottle of union. Let's see the union, everyone. Who, got, who was able to find it? Woo! Yeah! Awesome. It's pretty available in a lot of states. I hope that you guys were able to find it. If not, keep an eye out for it. And whenever you do see it, please pick up, do yourself a favor and pick the bottle. So we're gonna pour a little bit. This, this is how you taste mezcal. This is a little exercise we're gonna go through um, to kind of get you in the mood for all this information I'm about to dump on you. So we're gonna pour a little bit of mezcal in your glass. Right? Don't drink it yet. Um, now, I'm just gonna leave this open. You're gonna take a little bit of mezcal, like a drop, and you're gonna rub it on the top of your hand. Rub it. And now you're gonna smell it. So you're gonna get notes of stone, wood, agave, wet soil maybe, like a little bit of smoke. So you're, that's gonna wake up your nose, right? So now that you got that a little bit stimulated, now you're gonna smell your glass. Now you're able to pick up a little bit more scents. You're gonna pick up a little bit of sweetness, fruit, herbaceousness maybe. Definitely wood, definitely smoke. Now that your nose is awake, now we're gonna take a tiny little sip and we're gonna rinse our mouth with it, kind of cover your, your, your tongue with it. And that should be like a wake up palate. <laughs> that's gonna be like, woo, that's gonna wake up your palate. Now that your palate's awake, you can take another sip and you'll start to get a lot more notes. What are we tasting? We're take maybe a little bit of wood, fruit, but a little bit more defined fruit, maybe pears, apples, maybe a uh, very earthy, and at the very end of the lingering, you get a little bit of um, herbs, like something very herbaceous, um, maybe a little bit of citrus. The fruit comes from the espadine. It's a very common um, note to have with espadine mez um, mezcales. And the earthiness or herbaceousness comes from the cidial. Cidial uh, union is a blend of both espadine and cidial agaves. And you kind of get that on the palate. And now that we're warmed up, let's start with some education. So, like, a, what is agave? Let's start with the very, very basics. What is agave? Agave is a plant that's native to Latin America. 
there's uh, over 200 types of agave. Um, 108 of them are endemic to Mexico. So you can basically all of Mexico grows agave. Um, the cool thing about agave, people think it's a cactus for the most of, most of the time, but agave is actually a succulent and it's a lot closer to an asparagus than it is to a cactus, interestingly enough. Um, ever since like 6500 BC, uh, ancient civilizations in Mexico have been getting drunk off of agave. Uh, that started with fermenting agave juice to make pulque. Um, so, you know, the Mexico has been very well acquainted with getting drunk off of this plant. So um, distillation came way, way later with the, well, as far as we know, came way later with, you know, the colonizers, the European people coming over here. There are some evidence that maybe indicates to distillation being here previous to European colonization. But as far as like the facts accepted, accepted is that distillation started with them. That means that the Mexico has been producing agave for, or I'm sorry, mezcal for over 500 years, which is still a really long time. The agave plant, it basically lives to struggle and struggles to live and grow. It grows in really, really rugged conditions. Um, you might have heard before with wine that the harder it is for the grape to grow, the better the vintage is going to be. It's kind of the same with agave. Um, you get a lot of different mezcals from all over the for where it's allowed to make mezcals. And terroir plays a really big part of it. Um, a mezcal from Durango is gonna taste infinitely different than a mezcal from Oaxaca because of all the, the terroir. And what is terroir? Terroir includes, it's basically the environment in which the agave grows. And it includes everything from, you know, the yeast in the air, uh, the climate, topography, the type of soil, all these things affect in the, um, the agave plant and what nuances and what uh, flavors and notes you're going to get from it, which is really basically possibilities are endless, especially if you start with a blending like a Cidiado and Espadín blend or a Tobala and a Espadín blend. Like there's so much to agave distillates. So like I said, to call it a smoky tequila becomes a very reductive term. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, where can uh, agave be made? That's a really great question that I just asked myself. Uh, so but technically, legally, because of the DO, uh, mezcal can only be produced in Oaxaca, Durango, Guanajuato, uh, Guerrero, San Luis Potosí, Tamaulipas, Zacatecas, Michoacán, Puebla, Estado de México, y, and Aguascalientes. Uh, this is determined by the DO, the denomination of origin. Um, legally, you have to produce mezcal in those states to be able to legally label it mezcal on the bottle. Does that mean that those are the only places that mezcal has been produced before? No. Like I said, mezcal is a really old uh, tradition. It has been produced in Mexico for over 500 years. Uh, the DO decided that those are the states where you can legally call it mezcal, and that's what we're going by right now. Um, the DO... And this happened in 1994, so it's rather recent um, compared to, you know, 500 years of production. The DO is, we're not going to get too much into it today, but just know those are the states that mezcal can be produced and know that the DO is the, you know, the regulations and the laws are very complex and they can be very, very political because these regulations alienated a lot of producers and it also alienated a lot of traditions. So, you know, if your family has been making mezcal for five generations, for 500 years, and for, that's all you know how to do. And then all of a sudden you were in a state that in 1994 that it's not allowed to make mezcal, then it, are you not making mezcal anymore? Yes, you are. It's just that that law doesn't call it that. So without getting too, too much into that, um, it's kind of kind of a complicated topic. So we're not gonna get into that. We're just gonna have fun today. Um, so how is mezcal made? Okay, that's a really interesting process. It's really fun. I got the opportunity to experience it firsthand. I was at a distillery and it was so hypnot literally hypnotizing. It's such a cool, rustic, artisanal process. It's really, really magical, I would say. Um, let's start by breaking down the word mezcal. What is mezcal? Mezcal is a Nahuatl word. Nahuatl being an ancient language uh, of Mexico. Uh, and it's basically, if you break it down into two, it's metal, 
which means agave or maguey, and iscali, which means fire. So agave fire. So quite literally cooked agave. That's what the definition is. So that kind of gives you a little hint of how agave is made. When the piña is harvested, and keep in mind that agaves take a really long time to mature. Uh, what you're drinking, what you just drank is a, a espadín and cereal blend. Espadín can take up to eight years to mature. Uh, cereal can take up to 14 years to mature. So before even the harvesting starts, there's already an eight-year process behind it. So I would truly, mezcal is a spirit that's born old already, which is part of its magic. Um, so, you know, keep in mind all those years and then you harvest the agave. You cut all the big bankas, the big little like teeth looking, like um, sword looking leaves they have. You cut those down. Then you dig a really big hole in the ground. This uh, super deep, really big, really wide. Um, then you line this hole with volcanic rocks. In the middle of this pit, a fire is built. This fire, it's like burned for long enough to where the volcanic rocks turn into coals. It's really, really hot. And then you throw all the piñas into the oven, into the hole lined with rocks. You throw them all in there. So then you cover all these agaves and this hole with a bunch of dirt and a bunch of uh, bagasso, which is um, agave fibers. You cover it and you let it cook underground anywhere from three to 30 days. Um, this one in particular, it's anywhere from three to five days, which is why you'll notice that it does have smoke, but it doesn't overpower the nuances of the agave. And in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I think that all great mezcals are not gonna be so smoky that it will overpower the beauty that is this agave that took eight, 14, 15 years to grow. I think that the, the smoke, it, it is a characteristic that most people know. And yes, it is quite literally smoked underground. So it will have that, that layer of it, but you never want to mask the beauty that is this agave plant with smoke. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure you've tasted agave or mezcal is before that. It's like, oh, it's just so smoky, but it's just like, what are you trying to hide when it's that smoky? Just throwing it out there, something food for thought, for thought. Um, so, okay, so it's uh, cooked for anywhere from three to five days. Then it's taken out and it's put into this like a uh, little platform where there's a giant rock, like in the form of a wheel kind of, that rotates and it crushes the cooked agave. It like rotates around a bit. It's called a tajona or a molino. And it rotates around it. It crushes the agave plant, um, pulverizes it really. Um, and then it basically extracts the juice from the cooked agave onto this like really juicy cooked agave, um, agave fiber of agasso mosto uh, unit of just product. It's super juicy. All that stuff, it's then taken and put into these huge vats. And those vats are add a little bit of water because the agave is super, super sweet. The agave juice, the cooked agave becomes really sweet, a lot of sugar. So you add a little water to um, bring down the agave to the right level. Uh, once at the right level, it will start to ferment. Also, fermentation comes from the local yeast. It's for the most. There are some producers that will let they put their own yeast just to have more control of um of you know everything being the same at all at all times. But mezcal, artisanal mezcal for the most part will be like natural yeast. So they will be left open in these big vats. The natural yeast will uh, start the fermentation process. And like I was talking about terroir earlier, yeast will also be a form of terroir because yeast varies from place to place. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, if you go, if you ever get super into mezcal and start trying a lot of different ones, little things affect the flavor. So you can literally be making the same mezcal and the same with the same agave in the same village in, in two different locations. It will taste completely different, you know, because why? Because one person that was distilling it had a guava tree on site and chickens. And that will give the fermentation, the yeast, a specific like taste that ends up translating into the agave. And somebody in the other palenque in the same village, same altitude, same location, same climate would have a completely different taste. It's really, really interesting. So many variations that affect the taste of mezcal. So it's really interesting. And it's truly one of those things that the more you think you know, the more you realize you don't know anything, which is makes it really fun. It's kind of like wine. Um, after 
it's uh, fermented for a few days, then it's going to be distilled. There are different types of this um, forms of uh, methods of distilling. The most commonly used would be the copper still, uh, which is what when you use the copper alembics, alembic still. But if you want to get super ancestral with it, there's like some wooden stills, some clay stills. And if you want to get more industrial with it, they'll use column stills. But for the most part, it'll be copper. Once it's distilled by law and going back to the DO, um, it has to be distilled twice. Um, but it's distilled twice, it can either go in a bottle for sale and or it can go into a barrel for aging. Like I was saying earlier, mezcal truly is an, a spirit that's born old. So not a lot of producers are aging mezcal. And again, with, with, I mean, I like aged tequila, but I'm not a big fan of aged mezcal. And that's not to say it's bad or good. It's just not what I enjoy. But for me, it's because, like I said, I have so much love for this plant that, that took so long to grow. I feel like aging it and adding those nuances of the wood to it, it's kind of like masking something that's already beautiful. But that's just my opinion. If you ever come across a episode of Ranjepa that you love, be cool, tight, let me know. I'll try it out, whatever. <laughs> um, so, okay, so now that you learn a little bit about mezcal. Wait, are you gonna, are you saying we're gonna drink? Oh, oh, we're gonna drink. There are drinks to be had today. So I'm not really excited. <laughs> are you guys all ready to get uh, get your tools together and uh, everyone has tools, ice, all the ingredients ready to go? This is gonna be really exciting. Adele put together a really great menu for us. So uh, I think we're gonna start off with our stirred cocktail, uh, which is the one with the uh, banana oli sacro. So uh, we will need a uh, mixing glass. A pint glass works, um, a, a bar spoon, or just any ordinary spoon works. Um, you'll need something to strain. So go ahead and grab, if you have a Hawthorne strainer or a julep strainer, that will work. Or if you do not, go ahead and grab yourself like a slotted spoon. That that will do the trick as well. Um, it, if there's a will, there is a way. Yes, when you're bartending, <laughs> you will make that trick. Uh, so yeah, uh, go ahead and grab all your, all your gear and we're going to make our first stirred drink with Adele. I'm really excited. All right, Adele, how are we going to make this thing? All right. So for this drink, since your pod's already activated from doing that tasting, uh, of drinking just a mezcal neat, we're going to go for a spirit for a cocktail to start. The transition should be super easy. Um, and we're going to play with the cooked agave notes of the mezcal with the overripe banana notes of the oldo sacrum. And if you did your homework, you should be able to have this. If you don't have it, I got it, works fine, but then you're missing out a lot of the banana fun. Um, okay, so. Oh, can you specify the glassware? So for the glass, we're gonna do a, a double fashion, like a, a rocks glass. So any short glass that you have. Where am I on there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so any short bucket glass that you have should work. It should be fine. Um, the cool thing about this cocktail is that you can adjust it however you like. Uh, if you like your cocktails a little bit sweeter, just add a little bit more syrup. If you are not like a sweet person, I'm sure you're very sweet, but if you don't like sweets, you can just dial back in the syrup a little bit. And for the recipe, I call for uh, mole bitters. Um, I am of a firm belief that you should always kind of go with the region. Like if you're eating Italian food, drink Italian wine, so on and so forth. If you're going to eat oysters, get a white wine that's cold. So that's just kind of for me works. Uh, so, you know, mole bitters, uh, will have a lot of, um, spices that are used in mole, which is cinnamon, cloves. It pairs really well with mezcal. And if you ever get a chance to have a mole and mezcal dinner, I encourage you to do so. It is amazing. Uh, if you don't have mole bitters, Angostura will work just fine. This is a end all be all for eternity. I'm pretty sure this cures COVID because it's really that magical. So if you have those, that's fine too. Uh, we're going to start. We are professionals on that. No, don't, don't <laughs> <hurt> us. <laughs> so, oh, I think so. There we go. So we're going to start with like three healthy dashes of your bitters, Angostura or mole. Then we're going to add half an ounce of your banana allosacrum. Again, if you don't love sweet drinks, I would do quarter ounce. If you just are thinking for that sugar, three to three quarters. Why not? And if you don't like it, next round, you can just adjust it to how you like. And then we're going to do two full ounces of agave, um, a mezcal. You heard that 
two full ounces. Don't rip yourselves off, guys. Don't, Don't do rip it. yourselves off. In this pandemic, no way. And now, an important detail about stirring cocktails that go on the rocks. It's really important. Oops, not there. It's really important to not over stir them. Why? Because it's already going to go over ice. So if it's going to go over ice, you over stir it, you're just going to have a really watered down drink. So just give it a few stirs. Nothing too crazy. Just enough for it to combine. Get a little chill. Hey, Adele. Uh-huh. Uh, do you mind going through the process of how to stir properly on screen? And now you have a, 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 a the okay. up there. So you want to have this part of the spoon hit the side of the glass to create like a very smooth stir. You don't want to do this because you're just adding too much air to the cocktail. You just want to make it look clear and smooth. That will add uh, the right viscosity and the white uh, water dilution. And now we will strain this over our eyes. And we're going to garnish this with an express um, orange juice. So we're going to be real careful. This thing bites, so be real careful. And now this part, this is a pit, this is the skin. We're going to express it. I don't know if you can see in the camera, but you see all the oils come out. And the oils will rest because oil and water don't mix. The oils will rest on top of the cocktail, giving this a citrus aroma. And we can do a little like rub it inside of the glass. And every time you take a drink, you're gonna get a whiff of orange and then the mezcal and then the banana and then the bitters. So it should be a really layered cocktail, kind of like mezcal. Really like this. I guess. Salute. Yay! We're getting a cocktail! Woo! Salute! Cheers, everyone! Cheers, you guys! Oh, this one. This is banana oil saccharum. I made it last night. No, two nights ago. And I like tasted it afterwards. I was like, holy banana, that is good. And this cocktail, um, it's meant to be sipped slowly. If you want to get crazy with it, nutmeg on top would be delicious. Cinnamon on top would be delicious. Um, if you don't have oranges, lemons would be good. Basically, it's an old fashioned riff. So, any bananas and mezcal together go like peanut butter and jelly. It's so delicious. Um, so, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this cocktail and salute. Okay. All right. Awesome. So, go ahead and uh, ask if you have any questions, go ahead and put in the comments. Or if you need to be unmuted, let me know and we can talk for a second about, or you can talk to Adele. Um, about any questions. I see it here um, from Barbie. She says, mine did not turn into syrup overnight. Any idea why? Um, Barbie, where are you at? Let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, how do I find you? Oh, participants, there we go. Oh, Barbie, there you are. Oh, you unmute yourself? Um, yeah, the banana, the, the banana oleosacrum, we mixed bananas with sugar and it just was like, kind of sugary. Did you do bananas or banana peels? Did you do banana peel? peel. Yeah, sorry. But it huh. didn't turn into a syrup, like there were still banana peels in there. Was it supposed to turn everything into a syrup? Oh no. Oh, so you you take over, you basically, um, the bananas, it just, the, what all the saccharin process is, is the sugar extracts the oil from the fruit. You can do that with any kind of fruit, strawberries, uh, orange peels, lemon peels. What the sugar does, it is it, this like weird chemical reaction where it extracts the oils from the, the fruit. So it would be like the banana oils mixed with the sugar should turn into like a like a wet syrupy sugar. And those sugars you extract from, you the discard the banana peels and just keep the sugar. And it should have looked something like pretty viscous like this. This is literally banana peels covered in, in a sugar. And uh, after, this actually only took like four hours after the oils, the sugar extracted the oils. It just looks like a like a banana simple syrup. Um, maybe there weren't enough banana peels in your mix. Maybe that's the only thing I can think of. And also, um, or the banana peels will be still exist. They're not going to completely break down. 
So you just want to discard those banana peels. And, uh, and then what's left is like a really, really, really rich syrup. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anyone, is anyone having other questions right now? Uh, well, let me get back here. Anyone having other questions right now about the cocktail we just made? Um, otherwise, um, Adele's going to go into the next portion um, of, uh, of the educational part before we end. You guys can just chill out, sip on your cocktail, and, um, and then she's going to talk about some more stuff about union, which is really fun and awesome. Oh, um, okay. Uh, okay, we have a couple more questions, and then we'll move on to the next portion. And I'm going back to Adele here. Um, Adele... Let's see. Uh, can you repeat the recipe one more time? Yes, of course. Uh, so it's going to be three dashes of whatever bitters, mole bitters, preferably. But if you have Angostura, three healthy dashes of Angostura bitters. You're going to do half an ounce of your olosaccharum. Um, if you don't have olosaccharum, agave works as well. But this is so much better with the banana syrup. Um, then you're going to do two full ounces of your mezcal. Um, after that, you're going to stir it. Um, like I said, don't over stir it because then you're going to have a watered down drink since it goes over ice. Um, then you pour it, you strain it over your ice cube or whatever ice you're using. And then you're going to express an um, orange twist and then drop it in the glass. Awesome. Oh, dang it. Why am I on there? Sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. How long will oleosaccharum last? Ooh. I'd say three months, probably. I would say in, maybe the, fridge. in the fridge, about three months. Um, it's sugar, it's like a preservative, so it should last a fairly amount of time. But rule of thumb, if you have it in your fridge, shake it. And if it bubbles, that means it's fermented, that means you should toss it. That's uh, the, if you, if you shake it, if it doesn't bubble, yeah. <laughs> If it doesn't bubble, you should be okay. Also, check if you use one of those mason jars, those um, the airtight ones. When you open it, check the cap because sometimes it will, it will mold and you can tell. Um, so if you see mold, obviously, please do not drink it. But usually about three months should be okay. Um, if, like I said, if you shake it and it bubbles up, it means it's fermented, toss it. But it should last a fairly amount of time. The thing about uh, all the sacrament is it doesn't yield a lot. So this is not for like big batch projects you should never you if you ever try to batch you know a liter of all the saccharum you're gonna have a bad time because it takes it, it's just a lot of products well maybe not with banana peels but if you use citrus peels it's just a lot of products so this is more meant for like small batches half an ounce pours and whatever amount of cocktails um or you can use it as a cordial if you do this and add a uh, vodka you can make like a banana liqueur that way it's just it uses a cordial so yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, Luis asks, where can I get mole bitters? And thank you. And um, if you can't find mole bitters, do you have a, a another option? Uh, so mole bitters, I... I, it just, I guess it's availability wherever you live. Uh, we live in Los Angeles, so like we have a lot of access to a lot of things. We I got mine at the a local like um, specialty bar store they have all kinds of bitters but if it's not really available to you online it's a good choice and if you don't have uh mole bitters a good alternative to do so is angostura like do two dashes of angostura and one dash of chocolate bitters that um usually can replace the mole bitters pretty pretty accurately um if or you can just add a little cacao nibs to your angostura bitters and they'll be very similar to mole bitters uh yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. We all, uh, let's see. Seth recommended the cacao. Yeah. Bitters too. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Cool. cool, cool. Okay. Um, let's see. Adele, do you want to like, while we're kind of finishing up sipping on this, do you want us to get into the next educational portion about actual union and like yeah. why we're, uh, making the cocktails the way we are with, with this brand and, um, it's spec, it's real specifics. And then, um, after that, then we will uh, get into making our the second cocktail, which is, awesome. is going to be a shaking cocktail, which, which is, really is exciting. Yeah. All right, okay. Let's do it. So I would love to. Like I was saying earlier, I'm super excited to be collaborating with Union. It's a brand that I really love their business model, um, especially having when I went to Oaxaca. The thing that I was the most shocked and taken aback by was the disparity, the disconnect of 
you know, ordering a mezcal last word for $14 at the trendiest bar in LA to the people actually make, making it. There's so such disconnect between us as consumers and the product where it's being made. And then you realize that your people as consumers, we don't ask enough questions as to where our product comes from. And Mezcal Neo is very transparent when it comes to that. And their business model is based off of uh, trying to better the community. And, and I really, really respect and I really love that. Um, the story of Mezcal Neo started about 15 years ago. There was uh, three best friends from Mexico City. They decided they wanted to make mezcal. They had been to Oaxaca before, they were in love with the spirit. And they're like, we want to produce, we're going to get into the mezcal game, right? They didn't have a ton of money between three of them. I think they had like $10,000, which in, that's not a lot of money to start a business. I mean, maybe 15 years ago, it was worth a little bit more than it is today, but $10,000 is not a ton of money, but they put their, their savings together. Like, okay. How, what can we do with this? So they went to mezcal. They went from to, to Oaxaca, excuse me. They went from town to town, from Palenque to Palenque, trying to meet the right people and, and find the right place to be able to, to do this. Um, as they met their people and hung out with people, whatever, they they met an old man who was a mezcal producer. He was sharing his mezcal, telling them about the traditions, sharing stories, and then um, they were hanging out. And he, they, he said something that really stuck with them. And this old man said, the future of mezcal stands in union. The future of mezcal stands in unity. Individualism should stay behind because a path of progress is collaboration. And this like literally stuck with them. They're like, oh my God, that is like, the, this is what we came here looking for. And that was an uh, inspiration for them to start um, La Unión Mezcalera, which is a, a collective or a co-op. Um, they, they realized that that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to get all these mezcal producers together to create a brand and to, to help everybody be interconnected to be able to be successful. And in, in this mezcal game. So um, there was right there in San Juan Baltasar where Mezcal Union was born. Um, basically, they had four goals. One, to respect um, the artisan production of mezcal. Two, to produce mezcal that's self-sustaining. Three, they wanted the a good quality of production and the well-being of their producers. And three and four, let's be four, there you go, <laughs> four. Uh, they wanted to um, improve the social development and the economic uh, abilities for, for their farmers. So they created this, this awesome model of like, and, and they started questioning, what is unity? How is mezcal unity? How is mezcal union? Uh, Basically, they, they started thinking about what's important to us. And they wanted, it's Mezcal's unity because it preserves handcrafted traditions. Mezcal is unity because it enables progress. Mezcal is unity because it's community. Mezcal is unity because it's strength. And Mezcal is unity because it bridges, it gives us a connect to Mexican traditions, whether you're Mexican and you're um, connecting with your own roots or you're not Mexican at all, but it's just a bridge for you to get to experience Mexican tradition. So I thought it was like a super beautiful thing. Um, and their business model is my favorite thing about this entire thing and why I respect this brand so much. Basically their business model, and going back to the DO, the regulations, it's really expensive to get, what is it? The, there's a, the nom, this stamp right here, this, you can't import or sell mezcal and call it mezcal without this stamp. It's really expensive to get that stamp on your bottle, to be up to standards under the regulations, to be able to produce mezcal. And Oaxaca is one of the poorest states in Mexico. The line, the like 7% like of Mexicans live under poverty line. 44% of Mexicans live under poverty. And Oaxaca is one of the worst when it comes down to poverty in the, in the country. So this, I mean, for a gringo who wants to come down there and start producing mezcal, whatever, that's part of part of business costs. But for people who have been living in Oaxaca their entire lives, who have been making uh, mezcal for generations, that's a lot of money and they can't afford it. So a lot of 
the land in Oaxaca stays barren without any production happening because there's no economic resources to be able to produce agave. So that's where Mezcal Union saw a gap and an opportunity. They basically took all the, the economic risk. So they um, met up with families who had land, that, but they didn't have money to produce mezcal. And they basically subsidized the entire production from, from the beginning to end. And like I was mentioning before, agaves take a really long time to grow. So that's another big gap in why people, if you don't have resources, you can't really get started on producing agave because you don't get paid for at least six years, so for eight years, you know what I mean? Because you're waiting for this to harvest to be able to sell the agave. So you don't, unless you have the means to not have an income for whatever amount of years, you're not, you don't have money to produce mezcal. So Union um, contacted his families who have land and didn't have the economic means to produce agave. And they basically paid them uh, gave him a salary for the the in the amount of time that it took for harvest time. They gave him the money to be able to produce uh, and, and farm agave. And then when the agave is already for harvest, the return was the, that uh, Union gets to keep 50% of the agaves, which in turn is really beneficial for us as a consumer because since Union owns these agaves, their agave price, their mezcal price can stay pretty consistent and not have to abide by the mezcal, uh, the, I'm sorry, the agave fluctuation in price. Uh, you might know about this, but agave fluctuates in price a lot. Sometimes the shortages and agave becomes really expensive. And uh, sometimes there's an abundance and agave becomes really cheap, um, which market goes up and down every so often because Union owns 50% of these harvests, they're able to have a very, not only a very approachable price, but they're able to keep it that way, like consistently affordable, which is a really good thing for us as a consumer. Um, and then the farmer gets to keep on top of being subsidized for all, for the entirety of the, the process of cultivating these agaves, they also get to keep the other half so they can either sell it to whoever they want or they can sell it back to a neon the idea is and most of the time they do sell it back to a neon but they have the liberty of selling it to whoever they want which i think is a is a really awesome way of including mezcal producing families that otherwise wouldn't have the means to produce their own agave because that initial front cost is too much for them to be able to to bear. So that's where they came in. They're like, we'll, we'll help you get to where you need to be. And in turn, we get some of your agave. We produce the mezcal that we so badly wanted to produce. And you get to have a sustainable way of living. So I really love the business model. I feel like it's, it's truly fair trade. I feel like the word fair trade, fair trade is like used loosely, but I truly believe that this is like a fair way of making um, Mezcal. Uh, they also have put a lot of work into a lot of initiatives with reforestation of, of agaves. This one is uh, the one you tasted is this one goes strictly to the farmers like this effort right here goes to being able to subsidize more workers or more farms more families and have the juice I have in front of you right now. But this one which is didn't come out not that long ago is El Viejo and this is called El Viejo because an ode to the man that told them that mezcal should be unity. This is the other guy. This is for another class and another subject, but this one's delicious. If you have a, a chance to get a hold of this, please do it, it's amazing. Um, this one goes to uh, Tobala conservation um, efforts. They, Tobala is a very, uh, it's been over, over harvest, or I guess, there's a lot of demand for total loss. So there, and because it takes a really long time to grow, um, a lot of efforts are being put into reforesting these agaves. So the the proceeds of this goes to um, being able to reforest this, this wild agave. But we're focusing on this one right now. We'll talk about that soon. Um, so yeah, so as of now, with the, when they first started, they worked with one family, one palenque. As of now, they're working with 10 different families, I'm sorry, 20 different families and 10 different palenques. So they are, they're doing pretty good. And I think, like I said, I, I really believe that this is the right way to do mezcal. This is like the, the fair way to do mezcal where, where you're not only as a person with capital to be able to come in and produce mezcal, you wanna be able to be fair to the people who have been making this for so long. Um, and this bad boy over here, uh, they, I think they've planted okay, 260,000 
total loss so far in the, in the past three years, which is pretty awesome. Like I said, with this Mezcal uh, boom that everybody's interested in Mezcal now, um, they have definitely like been in over, like people are not taking care of the land properly because they're harvesting this Mezcal way too quickly. Um, and this is an, an effort to reforest those. Um, and yeah, let's, you guys thirsty? Are you guys still working on your, are you guys babysitting your drink or are you guys ready for another drink? I'm ready. <laughs> no, uh, that was like uh, amazing. And we had a couple of things here. How many families do they have producing, which I, I think you answered 20, right? I had 20 families so far and 10 different palancas. And that grows. Um, obviously with COVID and, and, and every mezcal, um, Palenque is suffering right now because there's not, you know, if you go to the store and you buy brands that you already know and you go for big brands, little brands like these uh, uh, are not, there's no demand for it right now. So right now, more than ever, you should really be asking questions of where you get your mask out and who, who are you benefiting from that? I think it's important to, to whatever brand is, you know, do your research because it really, really matters. Like your dollar is a vote. And if you want to keep Brands like these, a flow, you should vote with your dollar. I really believe that. Awesome. Uh, 100%. Like, this is why we're super stoked to be doing this um, with, on our platform here. So, um, you guys ready to shake? Uh, we're going to do the second cocktail now. And what we're going to be needing is we need a sh cocktail shaker. If you don't have a cocktail shaker, don't worry. There's a way. There's a way. Grab yourself a protein shaker or a water bottle, whatever you may have. Um, and then let's see, we're gonna, of course, we need the Union of Mezcal and we need a strainer. So if you have a Hawthorne strainer, that's going to be the best. If you don't have one of those, maybe a mesh strainer will work. Um, and some people have like the three part shakers that, that has a strainer built in. So that'll be just fine. Uh, what else do we need? We need our lemon juice. We need our Aperol. Uh, what else? We need a uh, oh, agave, agave syrup. So, and your jalapenos. And a jalapeno, because this is going to be spicy. Um, and then uh, if, you, if you can't do spicy, feel free to leave it out or just like do a little bit and make sure your seeds are out because uh, the seeds are the things that are going to be very spicy. Um, but otherwise, it'll give it a nice flavor. All right, cool. Adele, let's get into this thing. Has everyone read? Did everyone finish their first cocktail? Was it good? You guys all like feeling nice now? Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the uh, shaking cocktail. We like uh, cocktails with cocktails. We always like to do a stirred cocktail and a shaking cocktail, um, and usually original cocktail too, uh, just to give like the elements of the different ways that you, you can prepare cocktails and how those things work together. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's get into the shaking cocktail. Grab your shakers, make sure you got ice, and don't rip yourselves up. All right, Adele, here we go. All right, so I prefer spare for our cocktails because like i've been talking about nuances and layers and i really enjoy that that doesn't mean shaking cocktails aren't delicious uh you're gonna need you're gonna come across mezcal nerds who would tell you you should only drink mezcal neat yeah whatever i love mezcal neat but i if you're really gonna get into mezcal i really think that shaking cocktail is like the gateway drug to become a full-on mezcal nerd you have your first shaken mezcal cocktail and you're like whoa this is delicious then you have your spirit forward mezcal cocktail and you're like whoa this is delicious and then next thing you know you're just drinking neat mezcal if you um whenever you make this for somebody else like i don't really like mezcal you can make him a drink like this and then be like oh i kind of like mezcal next thing you know they know more about mezcal than you so this uh fun uh, cocktail is going to be a citrus cocktail patio pounder you can drink it by the pool it's perfect for a nice ashy day like today in LA. Um, and it's gonna play with some bitter oranges, which is comes from the Aperol. If you don't have Aperol and you have Campari instead, <laughs> if you don't have Aperol and you have Campari instead, um, you can just either dial it back a little bit and add a little bit more agave just to balance it out because Aperol is a lot sooner than Campari. Um, if you ended up using Cointreau with orange bitters, do the same specs, should work out pretty okay. Um, yeah, it's a very approachable cocktail and let's get started. So we're gonna start by muddling some jalapenos. If I like spice, so I keep the seeds in. If you don't like spice, I would take, I would devein and take the seeds out of the jalapeno to start. Um, you can do cucumber, mint works. If you want to do a bell pepper, that's cool too. But, you know, in the model, it's real nice. Now, we're going to start 
recipe uh talk about the how much you need to muddle i did three slices but like i said i really like spice um if we're gonna make sure it's really crush it in there a really hard shake i will also get crushed during your shake but you really want to make sure it's like pulverized in there to really get the juices and the oils from the seeds if you like it spicy or just get that like really nice green like peppery taste um when making cocktails rule of thumb you always want to start with your cheap ingredients um if you start with your mezcal which is your order your apra, which are expensive ingredients and then you know you forgot to add something or you added lime lemon twice and you're like crap my cocktail is ruined when you toss it you're tossing away product and this is especially terrible when you only have one worth like worth of one drink and then you ruin it that really sucks so always start with your cheap products in this case the jalapeno then we're going to do your lemon juice we're going to do three quarter ounce of lemon juice now we're going to do a quarter ounce of agave syrup your agave syrup should be diluted three to one water, one part water, three parts agave. This is mostly because um, agave nectar, when it comes in the, like in the bottle that you buy, it's too viscous. So when you shake it with the ice, it just gets solid and it just stays on the side of your, your tin. It doesn't really um, emulsify with your drink. So that's why we dilute a little bit of water and it's super sweet. So it's not really gonna cut back on the sweetness. It's just gonna, just for texture for you be able to shake. After that, we're going to do one full oh, ounce. I got a question. Uh, uh -huh. They're asking how much jalapeno again. I did three little wheels, but that's up to you. If you don't like spice, I would dial it back to two or one. And then so, uh, Serrano, same, same idea? Serrano, uh, yeah, Serrano should be fine. Yeah, the same idea. And then repeat the agave. Agave, you're going to do a quarter ounce. All right. And now we're going to do a full ounce of Aperol. And if you're not familiar with Aperol, the cool thing about Aperol is this is a, this is a bottle that you're going to keep in your bar and you're going to use it for a lot of things. It's it's a very versatile cocktail making uh, aperitivo. And think of Aperol like a bitter orange. Think of Campari like a bitter grapefruit. That's kind of like a great way to think about it when incorporating it into cocktails. And now, we're gonna do two ounces of mezcal. Don't cheap yourself out. Get your one and a half ounce out of here. We're not here for that. And now we're gonna shake. Uh, one more time, how much Aperol? One ounce. One whole ounce. You wanna talk about how much ice you got add in there? So I have like a one inch cube. So I did four cubes. Um, it really depends on your ice. If you're shaking with one, one of the giant cubes and just do one, um, it just depends on what kind of ice you have. Uh, I like to shake until I, until I feel the ice cracking. That's for me, like I hear the ice, that's how I know my, my, my drink is getting ready to be poured when I'm shaking and I can start feeling the, the ice breaking down. All right, guys, we're ready to for a shake. We're shaking! We're gonna strain. We're gonna double strain. If you have a double strain, it's great. If not, it's not a big deal. Um, no. Oops. And then again, we're gonna garnish this with a an orange twist. And I don't know if you caught the motif here, but oranges and mezcal go really good together. Uh, express that over your glass. And there you go, guys. Salud. Salud, Adele. This is, oh, it's A, it's beautiful. 
like gosh, mm. it looks like a like cantaloupe <laughs> <laughs> or like a maybe that's a yeah kind of cantaloupe color oh dude so balanced so good it's got like a little nice like bitterness from that aperol that balances out with the sweet oh yeah awesome 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 oh uh let's see barbie asks is that a lemon or an orange this is an orange uh this is an orange like i said it, it pairs really well with me oranges in general pair really well with mezcal and then you want to play with the orange notes from the aperol so it's orange but if you only have a lemon that's fine too this is just more to brighten up the cocktail mm -hmm. um okay so like uh you did mention a little bit earlier like mezcal with like um with orange how it pairs well together can you kind of like explain a little bit more like is there like is there a reason why uh that it does or is it more traditional or is it just like the nuances i think uh it depends on what mess you're drinking for this one in particular there are some citrus notes that are brought out by the oranges but traditionally if you go to uh if you go to Oaxaca, where mezcal is usually drunk meat, they will always serve you a plate of orange, sliced oranges, and sal de gusano, which is a salt that's made out of the worm that grows out of a, the agave plant. They take those worms up and they grind them up with salt. Um, they spice them and grind them up with salt. So you take salt, the that specific salt, and some oranges, and you kind of snack on it. Think of it as like a tapas situation. During your mezcal, you're eating your orange. It's a palate cleanser. Uh, there, like it does pair with most mezcals. There are some mezcals out there that are very cheesy tasting. I don't particularly love oranges with those mezcals, but for this one, it works really well. In this particular cocktail, and in the one with the banana, it's just kind of to brighten up a cocktail and to pair well with the citrus notes of the um, mezcal uno, the um, union uno. Awesome. Okay. Um, so that is our that's the two cocktails we're going to be making today uh with cocktails, with cocktails uh let's see oh uh eric says he just added the salde gusano half rim oh yeah cool. that sounds amazing yeah that's my kind of drink i like salty i like spicy yep that sounds amazing um okay let's see and then we got some questions coming in adele i'm going to kind of pan back and forth does mm -hmm. this cocktail have a name this one's called a hot mez Get it? <laughs> Hot mez, mezcal. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Boom. Awesome. Good name. Um, okay. If anyone, like, if you feel you want, at this point, we can unmute and talk um, if you would like to. Uh, let, let me double check with Adele here. Hang on one second. Um, Adele, is there anything else that you would like to get through or any other? information i think that's all i got for you guys thank you so much for uh lending me your ear slash screen um i really hope that this was useful to you as far as um you know being conscious about your purchase this to me you have to buy when you on butches ask questions you know if you are buying something that's maybe like too cheap ask why is that cheap and always know that when companies cut price they never cut it from the top they cut they always cut it from the bottom so it's usually your farmers are getting you know fucked over so i don't know if i can cuss on this but yeah so just ask questions um it's really important to do so and that makes you a more responsible consumer and ultimately it puts better product behind your bar all right all right all right let's see let me pan back over okay cool um so feel free to unmute you guys yourselves and stuff and like as we're as we're uh Oh, Scott, we got a, oh, sorry, Rose Scott is just now joining us. <laughs> um, but yeah, while we're finishing up our cocktails here, uh, let's unmute and we can chat. And um, I, uh, let's see, we got, um, oh, Natalie asked, how can we tip you? Well, thank you so much, Natalie, for asking. Um, we do have a virtual tip chart set up. Uh, we wanna keep bringing you these um, really, you know free webinars educational series and like um so yeah if you do want to uh give us a virtual tip that'd be amazing i can throw up the links in the comments as well as they're going a little thought wait no i don't even remember how we did this uh whiteboard there it is boom so that's our uh 
our PayPals and our Venmos for Talktails, uh, the podcast and Talktails, Cocktails with Talktails. Um, I'll throw the links up in the comments as well. Um, feel no stress. Uh, I know money's tight right now, but also um, any kind of share, any kind of uh, uh, tell your friends, like follow the podcast, subscribe, any of those things, you know, and this like time it with virtual stuff is like very important to like continue to do stuff and it shows us that you you know you're liking the stuff and if you don't like it well then we'll stop doing it <laughs> so, no we won't we're not gonna do it anyways uh so let's see uh i'm gonna throw those links up and then go ahead um and talk amongst yourselves and then let us know if you have any questions oh wait i got some uh will recording be made available yes um it's actually live streaming right now which is awesome on youtube so I do have it uh, recording right now as well on Zoom, but it's uh, live streaming on YouTube, and then that that YouTube live stream will be there forever, so you can refer back anytime you would like. Mm. Oh, here we go. We got a good one. Uh, this is an Adele question. Here we go. Adele, um, how many years? are needed for the tobola to be ready for harvest so that that's totally up to like the conditions it's growing um there's a whole like you hear 20 years 25 years uh where they're getting the tobola for the viejo it takes up to 14 years but that like i said it just depends on um on the terroir there are places where where it will take up to 20 years to mature and the thing about agaves is that you don't say oh it's been 20 years time to cut this the agave will tell you when it's ready it will start growing a, a what they call a guillote, which is a long stem from the middle of the agave, and it will start to flower. When it starts to flower, all the sugars from the piña are starting to travel up to the flower. So that means it needs to be cut down so the sugars remain in the piña, and then you can harvest it for for uh, for mezcal production because you want to keep the sugars for fermentation. Um, that could be 14 years. Literally, the agave will tell you when it's ready. You don't need to tell the agave, but uh, typically anywhere from 14 to 20 years. And it's also like a smaller plant. You got to think about yield too. Um, Espelina is a way bigger agave, so it's a bigger yield. But uh, I think you need 11 kilos of tobala to create one liter of mezcal. And tobala is not a huge plant. It's about like this big. So you got to think about yield too. So you need a lot more of it, which is what makes it not necessarily super rare, but also, but just like really expensive to produce. All right, and then let's see, we got, um, do you have a name for the first cocktail? I just call it banana, uh, banana mezcal old fashioned, which is, you know, what it is. Let's call classics the classics they are. It's an old fashioned. It has bitters, it has sugar, and it has spirit. Uh, okay, do you know if they are distilling the two agave separately and then blending at bottling, or are they distilling together at the palenque? So they are actually, uh, they already have the blend in mind. So they, they cook them together and distill them together. I know some producers will do it separately and then, and then blend them kind of, uh, a lot of tequila producers do that too with their aged, um, uh, the, uh, you know, with aged spirits. But um, this one in particular, they're both cooked together and also uh, distilled together. Uh, okay, all right. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All right, guys. Uh, did you get uh, anyone have any more questions? I feel like you should. But what if I have any more questions? Thank you so much. This was great. Well, thank you so much. Are you kidding? Thank you so much. This was awesome. I'm really glad you guys tuned in. And then I will be shooting out more information about uh, future like stuff like spirits and cocktails and different things like that so check it out follow us do all the good stuff do the good deed um and then hey uh everyone give a round of applause to adele this lady knows her shit um and uh we we, we always need more influenced people like this and uh adele's just killing it she's like a wealth of knowledge and i learn from her every single day uh, Adele, is there anything you would like to um, kind of wrap up with everyone? I uh, just want to say thank you for being here. We really appreciate your virtual presence. I know these times are super weird, um, but we really appreciate the opportunity to connect with you one way or another. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And um, Mesco helps to cope. <laughs> <laughs>
with a lot of things, <laughs> including, <laughs> including 2020. <laughs> Seth's got another question. Uh huh. Uh, he says, "What am I going to make next? Any modern classics for my union?" Ooh, honestly, I am a big fan. Uh, when I first started getting into mezcal, it was via co- like through cocktails, and literally any classic that you love, take the main spirit and put it into into um, the cocktail. Like a, a, a mezcal last word is delicious. Uh, if you want to do a Manhattan with liquor forty three, it's delicious. Um, what about naked and uh, a naked and famous? That's like a it's like a paper plane riff, and it's a after all so you have that already um yellow chartreuse uh mezcal and lemon and it's it's a fantastic cocktail you can make a mezcal penicillin those are one of my personal favorites delicious medicina? Uh, medicina latina <laughs> <laughs> so honestly like just take any cocktail you love and put mezcal instead of whatever spirit and you nine ninety nine percent of the times you'll be satisfied oh i hear a uh, 21st century but swap out mezcal for gin Ooh, yeah. I mean, honestly, like, uh, I love spirit forward cocktails with mezcal. Um, there's my favorite spirit for spirit forward cocktail mezcal. It's called Better and Better, and it's going to be one and a half ounces of mezcal, uh, half an ounce of uh, overproof Jamaican rum, Smith and Cross or Dr. Bird are fine, and a quarter ounce of velvet falernum, kind of like an old fashioned riff with a lemon twist is delicious. Um, anything with citrus is really good. Honestly, mezcal is very versatile. You can, you can put it in anything. Just make sure that it's balanced and that you don't overpower the spirit with everything else that you're adding onto it. Um, let's see, Steven, uh, I'd love to connect to you on Instagram. I think we are connected on Instagram actually. Like, I, I think that we, I know your Instagram handle and now that I'm looking at your face. I think that we are we are like off for friends, <laughs> but I'll double check. Yeah, we'll connect. Um, okay, now we got another question. Let's see. Um, okay, uh, this might be a dumb question. Never, never, um, no such thing. Blue agave is the one used for tequila. Can that be used for mezcal? No. So, so not because it can be used for mezcal. It's just again the do. I just kind of makes everything super convoluted and super uh, muddy, but uh, tequila can only be made in um, Jalisco, Michoacan, Nayarit, uh, Tamaulipas. And I forget, there's another state involved. I can't know the top of my head, but a few states that can only be made, it can only be made from blue Weber agave. So in an effort to capitalize on this like tequila making process, the DO basically said that if you're making Mezcal, say you're in Oaxaca and you grow blue weber agave, you can't call it mezcal because the blue weber agave, which is protected by tequila. Really, it's just kind of like obnoxious, very muddy. Um, although the term mezcal really means agave distillate, it's a whole thing. It's like I said, very political, it's very convoluted, but rule of thumb, um, tequila can only be made from blue weber agave. Uh, and it can only be made in certain states. Jalisco being the most well-known of those. Okay, so uh, a few more questions. Um, oh, Seth says, uh, one ounce, a mezcal, one ounce chicharro, uh, 0.75 lime, point, uh, 0.5 simple. This is my go-to, and the penicillin looks fab, he says. Um, and then um, Eric asks, can you repeat that recipe with rum and falernum? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's called a better and better, and it has one and a half ounces of mezcal, half an ounce of uh, Smith and Cross, or if you have um, Doctor Bird, that would work too, uh, and quarter ounce of Velvet Falernum. You stir that, you pour it over new ice, and then you express a lemon, a lemon twist, and it's delicious. And the thing about that cocktail is very high proof because of the rum. So as the ice melts, the cocktail gets better and better. Hence the name. I love funny names, cool names. Um, okay. Uh, wait, wait, hold on. Uh, it says, uh, hot mez, in quotes, is my new favorite. Where can we find you, Adele? I work at the Black Cat in Server Lake. You can also find me once a week on wherever you listen to your podcast via Talk Tales of the Podcast, because I co-host that podcast with Shauna Race. Um, and, uh, 
yeah. You want to come over to my house? Hey. <laughs> Actually, I heard she's barbecuing later, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm ready. I can't wait. Awesome. All right, you, you guys have any more questions? Do you want to? I, I mean, I feel like we are down to enough people that if you want to unmute and just say hi, then by all means, uh, please do. Uh, I feel like I know Stephen already because we're friends on Facebook. <laughs> we're not Facebook, Instagram. I don't think we're friends on Facebook. Uh, so I, had a, I had a quick question. Yeah, Randy. Um, so I haven't, I'll, I haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, but, um, you said you'd be putting out the info for more of these classes on that podcast. Uh, yeah. So, uh, subscribe with your own, um, uh, beware. <laughs> no, uh, so yeah, uh, we'll be like mentioning everything on the podcast as well as I will shoot up emails. So everyone that like signed up for this, uh, webinar, uh, I have, I can, filter out all the different like events we're going to be doing the next like forever. Um, if I get annoying, please tell me, which I try not to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, um, so I think, yeah, we're setting up the next one. It's, I think we're going to be calling it a Sunday fun day and we're going to be doing brunch cocktails. So, uh, I know that like, like time frames for people are a lot different. So I always try to keep that in consideration with the classes and give like a, a as much of a, time frame to give people all over the world at this point because uh, people are joining all over, from all over the world so uh i think it, within the next like four weeks i'll have another um webinar set up and it's going to be focused on sunday brunch cocktails is my next goal and which is going to be really fun because sun you know as summer's wrapping up we kind of had like a funky summer and a funky like year i'm still having a funky year but um uh, brunch has always been a really fun thing. So I think that we're, that's going to be the goal and, um, Adele will be a part of it too. And she, she's such a wealth of knowledge. Um, and, then, uh, in the future we're bringing on, uh, experts from all spirits. Like, and so we're in Los Angeles. And so, um, agave spirits are always very popular here because we're so close in vicinity to Mexico and we're, we're as bartenders, we're very influenced by these spirits. So, um, I was really excited to start this thing off, kick it off with Newton and Miss Cal and Adele, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, feel free to subscribe to the podcast. We're silly. We're, we don't take ourselves, we don't take any of ourselves seriously. And we, um, we don't really dabble in the educational side of it in the podcast. We do bartender stories and then we just change our platform during COVID to bartender advice. So everyone who wants to, they can like call in at any time, leave a voicemail and we'll answer your, any question you have at all with, uh, as bartender advice. It's called cheaper than therapy. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for all the work you guys put into this. Awesome. Yeah. No problem. Like we, uh, we love it anytime. Um, cool. Like does anyone, is everyone feel good? Y'all, y'all lubed up. I got a question. Uh, yeah, Seth. I've never. I, I live in Portland. Um, being on the West Coast, uh, I feel like a lot of people are familiar with LA, but I've never been. If I was to go, what would be the first cocktail bar I should hit up? Ooh. Well, it depends. Or, or Hinkful, even. I don't know. Okay. Uh, ha like, well, Portland has some like top. Yeah, like, like I, I'm pretty class cocktail bars. I, I've, I've been in the industry for a minute and uh, so I'm pretty open to new things, but, um, but yeah, like, like what would be kind of exciting to, to go to in LA? Well, um, oh, okay. I'll send this. I'm going to send this to Adele real quick. Okay. Well, hoping that when you do come down, everything's pseudo back to normal. Um, yeah, I highly recommend, yeah, hopefully, I mean, there's still a lot of places that are doing some really cool, uh, to go programs, but I will highly recommend to go to Gracias Madre. Um, it's a vegan restaurant, which I'm not like, you know, I'm not vegan or anything like that. I'm not hating, but it's just like, not like my thing, but their cocktail program is incredible. And they only carry agave distillates and they only carry agave distillates that are small produced no diffuser, no autoclave. It's like the guy who runs our cocktail program is a genius when it comes to agave distillates. If you want to know anything about mezcal, he's a man. They're doing a lot of cool clarified cocktails and they just came up with a really incredible um, Oja Santa mezcal martini that I cannot wait to get my hands on. And 
that they have the best Paloma I've ever had in my life. And I've had plenty. That place is incredible. If you like agave, which I, because of this, I know you do highly recommend you go there. Thunderbolt is another really good one. Um, they do really, really cool stuff. Um, let's see. Hippo is really great. Otoño is really great with, if you like Spanish spirits and sherry. Um, it just depends on what you're into, but it's just kind of difficult to answer that question right now because all of these places may not come back after COVID. So here's to hoping for a better 2021 where all these cocktail bars get to come back and you get to come back to a city that has a lot of bars available for you. Absolutely. And um, right now, if, you, if you're trying to like come to Los Angeles, for whatever reason right now um the, the 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 situation here with covid is that if it's a uh a patio if there's a patio set up then you can have cocktails from these places um like adele she, she's at a black cat right now and their patio is totally set up like very chill very like covid safe da, 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 da. um and, but you have to order food of course so you keep keep that in mind basically um yeah, but it's a similar boat here in portland right now Okay. Yeah. They're, yeah. Kind of open. They're doing outdoor seating, um, very, very limited indoor seating, but it's pretty much like whatever's open. Yeah. If you want a cocktail while you wait for your to go food. I think the rooftops are open right now too. So. Oh yeah. 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 So uh, if you go downtown, which downtown is like crazy right now, but um, if you do go downtown, the, all the rooftops are open and they're open air. So I think they're like pretty like safe, like space to like go and have some really great cocktails. Steve says, same in Aurora and, and Denver. Yeah, this is a weird time to be bartender. <laughs> this is why the virtual thing has been the whole thing right now. Um, all right. How are we all feeling? Eric, good? Any input? There we go. Thanks for doing this. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Absolutely. Anytime, Eric. Uh, th thank you guys for joining us for sure. And it's nice to meet everyone. Luis, you good? Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Winnie, 100%? After those two cocktails, super good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we did our job, I think. We did our job. <laughs> Elizabeth, we don't have your video. And Vianney, we don't have your video, but I hope you're both doing well. You can put on audio if you want. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's do a last uh, let's do a last uh, wrap up. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'll shoot you an email for our next uh, webinar that we're going to do, and I can't wait. And it's so nice to meet you guys. And Adele is just the best in the world look at those look at those ripe bananas uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much again once again thank you thank you for being here really appreciate it and uh, it's a great way to spend a Saturday I hope you guys are all nice and toasty <laughs> we'll see you next time <laughs> all right peace love and happiness <laughs>